Hello and welcome to New Humanum. My guest today is Constantine Kishin. He's a, an ex-stand-up comedian. He's also of Jewish ancestry and he wrote a bestseller, An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West. Constantine, welcome to New Humanum. Thank you. Um, start with your family background because, um, as the book title suggests, you're an immigrant. Um, What's the family ancestry? So uh, I was born in the Soviet Union in the early 80s uh, and saw the tail end of the Soviet Union. My family f were from different parts of the former Soviet Union. So my, gra my uh, grandfather, my father, they grew up in Soviet Uzbekistan. My mother's family from Ukraine. Uh, a lot of them were either dissidents or persecuted in the Soviet Union for various reasons to do with saying the wrong thing, being the wrong ethnicity. Uh, most often being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, so uh, one of my grandmothers was actually born in a gulag, something I, I talk about in the book a lot. Uh, and so I, I, I come from a very different world. And not only do I come from a different world, but you know the way I grew up, all of these stories of things that had happened in Soviet times previously were uh, passed down in a way that was kind of hard to forget. You know, when, you, when you're when your grandmother tells you about watching her little brother starve to death on the way to deportation to Siberia, these things sort of stay with you. Um, so uh, that, 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 was, that was kind of my family background. And even in my own lifetime, I saw uh, my grandfather, who eventually ended up moving to the UK, which is why my parents sent me to school here, to be near him. Uh, he uh, criticized the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan uh, in the, I think it would have been about the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, immediately his house was searched by the KGB. Um, he uh, was fired from his job. His wife was fired from her job. And both their children, my father and my aunt, were kicked out of university as in this sort of collective punishment. And actually, it'd be funny with your uh, former BBC background that the worst thing, the worst crime that he was found to have committed was he had a radio receiver in his house that he used to listen to BBC World Service and that, that he was really done for then when they found yeah, that well out. Yeah, he deserved to be punished for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, um, was it disconcerting when you, when you were sort of parachuted into a completely different culture as a young boy? Well, I didn't speak any English. I was 13 years old and I arrived at boarding school with all these arcane traditions and things you're supposed to know how to do and whatever. So it was very disorientating and the first couple of years were really tough adjustment. Uh, but what I really did enjoy about boarding school is that it gave you an opportunity to discover what you were good at uh, over time. So I was part of the school debating team and I played different sports. That, and so even, um, you know, that was actually my first discovery, even before I'd learned to speak English very well or was doing well academically or was doing well in other things. Uh, sport really gave me an outlet to like, oh, if you do well in this, suddenly you are respected and taken seriously and whatever. <laughs> and that really, for me, people talk about the old boy network, which I haven't found useful at all. All the people I went to school are complete idiots. But, uh, and I haven't been in touch with pretty much any of them, really. But what I did find is it gave me an opportunity to discover things that I could do and be good at and be recognized for. And that taught me from an early age, if you find things that you're good at and you go out and do them, you will get the things that you perhaps want out of it. So that, that was it. It's all about confidence actually, isn't it? I mean, they're, they're, if you're good at something like that at a boarding school, at a public school, um, you know, that, that, that makes you a popular boy. You get a bit of success. I mean, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> I don't think I was that popular. I was a bit of a contrarian asshole. Uh, still am really in many ways. but. Uh, it definitely gave me a sense that if I put my mind to something, I can get what I want. Uh, and I learned that from an early age, which has been really beneficial. There's Jewish ancestry in your background. Isn't a little bit. Uh, Jewish. Yeah. Jewish. Yeah. Right. Um, is that something which has, has figured in your life at all? Uh, not a huge amount other than culturally, because uh, Kissin, my surname, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's a bit of a giveaway in Russia. So even if you don't self-identify as Jewish, other people will identify you as Jewish for you. And also, you know, uh, lots of Jewish jokes in my family. And I think some of the attitudes too, you know, 
Um, my aunt, who, who is uh, uh, twice as Jewish as me, uh, half Jewish, she, she always talks about how uh, you know, our whole family went through the Jewish pentathlon, which is like music, academics, you know, all of these things. So the, the cultural attitudes that Jews will have often used to survive, yeah. which is making sure your children get a good education, making sure they go into a profession that's going to be, uh, you know, bringing, you know, food or putting food on the table, all of these things, I, certainly, yeah, absolutely. Are you curious about it? I mean, are you curious about the Jewish faith, are you, are you, are you um, at all attracted by it? Uh, I think as I get older, I, it's, it's, uh, it's I, as I get old, but also, you know, as you know, I host a show called Trigonometry and we have, we keep coming up against the same problem where without a superstructure that sits on top of all of our ideas, once you put man on the pedestal that God has been thrown off, you you get to the place that we've got to, which is where human beings fundamentally lack a sense of their connection to each other, um, and all of the problems that we can then you know cascade down from that. Um, so, I, I the, the difficulty I think for a lot of people from my generation actually is that we we're all the children of Dawkins to some extent, or the, or the children of New Atheism, and so we struggle to go. I believe in, in, in the man with the beard in the sky, but also if you're intellectually honest, you see that human beings do need something like that in order for society to function. So I'm less curious on a personal level, ironically. I'm more like at the level of society, maybe this is, what, this is something that we need. And you know, you and I were talking about this last night. It's quite difficult, I think, to get people like me to, to, to make that final leap. So what is it that we can do to maybe take some of the, the rules, and maybe even that's the wrong word, maybe that's too prescriptive, but you know, I, when Jordan Peterson had me on the show, he grilled me for about God for three hours, uh, not something I expected. Um, but this is one of the things we talked about, that I think whatever it is, the thing that is really absent for most people is meaning and, and, and purpose. Right now, how do you? How do you? It's not about providing. It's how do you invite people to go? That's what. That's what you actually want, right? So, what is it that's going to give you that? And unfortunately for me, once you start looking, you often find that the answers are actually in very old traditional things that have been known for millennia. Mm. Quite often, right? So, I, I, I almost feel like our generation is sort of rediscovering things for the, for the first time that everyone's known for quite a long time. That, that's where we are. Without um, flattering you too much, I'd say you were a very acute observer of some of the, the most pressing problems in this society. There is a sort of, um, well, one might almost say a sort of moral chaos mm. in, in society. And what you're talking about there, this, this sense that perhaps there was something in religion uh, when it was more widely practiced, when we were perhaps a more religious country than we are today, that maybe that um, provided the sort of firm foundation for society which is now lacking. Yeah, well, uh, James Orr, when we had him on the show, uh, this is one of the things he talked about. He said, we need something that is pre-political. And if you don't have something that's pre-political, then it's very tempting for people to believe that their politics means that they're in different tribes, not, not in the sense of we're part of the same country and we want the country to thrive, but we've got different views about how for that, that should happen, but more like you're the enemy, right? Because if there's nothing else we agree on, and if we can't even agree, you know, that Britain is some kind of uniting identity, the most important thing is that I'm, you know, Jewish or I'm this or I'm that and you are an evil straight white man or whatever, then w what is it that, that binds us together? Uh, what, the fact that we live in the same economic unit? Uh, that, that's not really a recipe for a cohesive society. And particularly, in a, you know, in a place like London where everyone is living in a very atomized existence. And it's not just London, it's all over the country now. Um, Th that fraying of community, the increased atomization, it, it causes people uh, misery, and you can see it. Yes. You, it it's, yeah. And um, no one wants to say it because you sort of sound like a god botherer, which is therefore easier for me because I'm not. 
right? But the fact is, young people and the statistics bear this out. They're they're, they're not happy. No, I mean there's a there's a there's an epidemic of of, of mental illness, particularly amongst young people. Yeah. But then, well, it's not even mental illness. It's like mental. It, it's not even disease. It's dis ease. It's this sense of life not having meaning or purpose that there's a, a kind of lack of direction of travel for a lot of people there is a sort of like what am i supposed to do exactly and you see this you know the conversation about fertility is now making uh making not a comeback but it's kind of emerging because a lot of people have have been not it's, it's almost like, it's because it used to be the default setting, no one used to think about it, but when it ceases to be the default setting, you have to like discover it for the first time again. And quite often, it's quite late by the time that you have. You know, my wife and I, we had our uh, first child at 39, you know. And look, I don't want to pretend that it's purely a cultural thing. There's obviously economic factors, the, the housing crisis and so on. But a lot of the stuff that's happening is, I see is a lack of, sort of passed down wisdom and and I understand it because for my generation the sort of top-down authoritarian you know half children that doesn't really work for people of my generation the younger we don't like being told what to do I never did um, so it has to be invitational it has to be like well what do you want do, do, is is what is your life giving you what you want because if it is great but if it's not well here are some of the ways that human beings throughout the, the centuries have got to the place you're trying to get to, which is your life has gives you the feeling of meaning and fulfillment, and these are some of the things that might be the answers. So, as a as a young father now with mm. a, with with a child, of course, um, you will now be um, rearing that child and in inculcating the values that um, that you want to see in your offspring. So, um, without a religious framework, how do you do that? Well, I, I think the, the, the phrase that a lot of people use is we're sort of living off the fumes of post-Christian civilization, so that, or post-Judeo-Christian civilization, let's say. So I've, I, I was actually having this conversation with someone else the other day where we both acknowledged that we sort of, we've had to work out our moral compass piece by piece and perhaps still in process. Um, so it's, it's a very customized version of my own values that I, I'd hope to pass down. But you're... But you've, you've absorbed and are retransmitting some of those old Christian values, perhaps. Perhaps. I, I, I don't know. It's just, like, I've, I, as I said, I've had to work it out piece by piece and, and go, well, the Buddhists say life is suffering and these people say this. And what, like, how do you... Yes. And so it's a mix of psychology and, you know, uh, and I'm sure a lot of it, uh, the more I look it into, the, the more I will find that these are very old things that we've always known. What do you make of the, you know, the the golden rule, that uh, you know that I treat you, you treat your neighbour as yourself. Mm. Right? Now, as a rule for life, how does that strike you? Uh, very, very bad. Very bad. Uh, a very. Uh, I think it was Bernard Shaw, wasn't it, who said, "Do not uh, do unto others as you wish to have done unto you. Their taste may not be the same." Uh, so I think. Uh, the, the, the idea that your neighbor has human dignity and is worthy of your respect and time and attention, these, this is obviously great. Uh, but beyond that, I think uh, I, I'm always interested in having the sensitivity to each individual without wanting to impose my own particular worldview on them. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry for that slightly flippant answer, but I, I think that's, that is important, actually. Yes, but the conferring of dignity, um, as you say, it's mm. very important that one treats others with respect. Um, arguably, that does come, there's a, a religious wellspring for that. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And therefore, does that not make you think that maybe, well, where you sit now, do you rule out the idea you might ever be a man of faith? I'm agnostic. I, I, I've never been a hardcore atheist. It's, it's almost like there is no. I, 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 it's, it's, uh, I don't know, but I am much more interested in the ways of living than the, the theology of it. Do, do you see what I mean? I do. Yeah. I do. We're talking in the margins of this uh, NatCon 23 mm. National Conservatism First 
um, conference of this type ever held in the UK, I think. I've been struck, I don't know if you have, by the number of people here who, who do identify as religious. Mm -hmm. What is it, do you think, about the religious, about the religious mindset which um, seems so consonant with, with politics of the right, conservative politics? Why do those two things seem to mesh together? Well, it's hard for me to say because I, I never really thought of myself particularly nationalistic or particularly conservative. But it, it seems to me, that, and you know, running my show, we have employees, some of whom uh, or team members, as we now say, um, who who are religious. And my sense is, you know, if the religion is passing down of of a set of traditions that works, that maps very neatly onto a political world view that is about preserving what is good about a society. So that, that makes sense to me. I imagine it does to you as well. I think um, the, the reason I, I am not entirely on board with that is that I'm a big fan of creative destruction, which I think is necessary. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, my background in stand-up, it, it, it is naturally a place for irreverence. And I think that's important, actually. I think culturally that's important. I think uh, societally you have to have you know, and Americans do this much better than us to some extent, in that they're capable of combining religion and like a drive to progress at the same time, much better, I think. There is a slightly, there's a bit of staleness to the way that we do things in Britain when it, because there's a sort of like, let's just not let anything, you know. Um, so uh, I think, yeah, I mean, look, the passing down of ways of being that work makes sense in terms of mapping onto like, let's just keep everything fairly preserved. It's interesting, isn't it, that the, you know, this, the old cliche about uh, never talk about uh, sex, politics and religion. Mm. And the British take that quite seriously, unlike in America, as you say, where politicians are, are only too um, happy, eager and willing to, to, to fly whatever confessional flag they attend to. Whereas here, politicians run a mile if you want to talk about religion with them. I think it's a reflection of uh, the society. When you go to America, it's not politicians who, who will shove your, who will shove their crucifix down your throat. It, it's the ordinary person too. And I don't mean that in any disparaging no, no, way. No, no. Uh, people in America will tell you, not, it's one of the first things they'll tell you. They'll say, well, I'm a Christian, therefore blah, 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 or I'm a this and therefore blah, blah, blah. The, the conversation about faith in society is different. And so their politics, I think, reflects that. I don't know that, you know, if Rishi Sunak went on stage at the Conservative Party conference and started banging on about Hinduism, that you'd do particularly well out of that. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and likewise, a Christian doing the same. I just think our society treats those issues very differently. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and in some ways, uh, it is a pity to me because we've had guests on my show who are like, I, I'll ask them a question about, you know, we had the former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia on the show recently, John Anderson, who is a Christian. And we asked him about how he overcame the tragedies that he experienced as a child. His mother died of cancer when he was three. And then he hit a cricket ball while playing cricket with his father, hit his sister in the back of the neck, and she died in front of him. And I sort of, we were asking him, well, how did you overcome that? And he, he sort of very apologetically said, well, I'm afraid this is where my faith comes in. Do you want me to talk about it? You know, whereas that wouldn't have happened in other ways. And I... I I, I, I actually do find it frustrating how uh, people feel embarrassed to mm. talk about their faith. I don't want them shoving it in my face no. without being asked. But if there's something to say, I don't think people should shy away from that. Because uh, I think we, we do have a slightly uh, sort of like snooty attitude, I think, to religion, um, which I, I think is unnecessary, you know. And it's partly, you know, I grew up watching comedians mocking the religious right in, in 1990s America, where frankly it needed mocking, in my opinion, right? But I also think we perhaps got carried away with that and sort of just started thinking that oh, the religion is therefore to be mocked because some people on the religious right behave in ways that we don't agree with. And then we sort of threw away the baby with the bathwater a little bit. Yeah, I mean, what you're talking about, um, you know, shoving religion down people's throat, it's... Um, it's a, it's counterproductive because people, there's a sort of aggression about that which can be very off-putting. 
Um, and who wants to be, you know, who wants to be preached at in the street? It's, mm. a, it's quite an aggressive thing to do. Um, so I'm absolutely with you there. That's not the way to go about it. But this reticence about uh, religion in this country, actually, it seems to screen out a whole um, area of human experience and territory, which we can't talk about publicly. Mm. It's odd. Yeah, I think we should be able to. And and by the way, just um, I, I'm really I, I'm I'm not someone who's uh, all that interested in theory much, but I'm very I'm very I- empirical in the way that I see the world. And so when I observe, you know, I I meet many uh, Anglicans or Christians in this country, and they have what I call the Anglican glow. You know, there's a kind of peace that people often come across as having um, that I think you know that's. For, for some people, that's the way. And I think, I don't think we should be afraid to, to have those conversations, uh, especially with people who, who don't believe if they're interested in hearing the discussion. I, 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 so my personal evolution has been to be able to hear that without sort of switching off and thinking, okay, well, this person's boring. Who do I talk to now? You know, um, But I think everyone... It's also part of growing up, I think, and maturing over time as well. Um, and in a, in a society that, that lacks meaning and purpose, I think there will naturally be a tendency for people to be interested in, in ways of filling that hole. And as we talked about earlier, that may not always be religion for everybody, but I think the question is in many people's minds now. Finally, I mean, you're, you are um, a sort of cultural observer, as it were, and um, you frame your, your observations very cleverly and wittily. Are you optimistic about the country? I mean, do you, um, you know, you're a sort of adopted Englishman. Now. Hmm. Do you think the country's, you know, w- what's your take on where we are and where we're going now? People always ask me this question, and uh, I promise you this is not a cop-out, but the truth is I genuinely don't know. I genuinely don't know. I feel that, uh, you know, that I, I saw in the news uh, the other day that the former c- civil servant who was head of the Foreign Office has given an interview on retiring in which he said Britain is over or something like that, like our role in the world is over. And um, I, I'm starting to wonder because I think when we first started looking into all of this, I had the impression, perhaps slightly Americanized impression, that the people who are quote unquote you know ruining everything are these like pink haired people with rainbow flags and whatever and increasingly i just think it's 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 a sort of like it's this blobbish managed decline crowd who just think well, you know we've had our time and and, and we just got to roll over and die and i don't know if if they're going to win but what i do know is a civilization that is incapable of defining what is good about it will not survive, will not survive, cannot survive. And that's why I've tried to speak as much as I have been able to about the need to see ourselves as good, the need to see ourselves as uh, people who have contributed good and bad, but good to history. The fact that most of the ideas that make the West what it are actually what it is come from this country. Most of the ideas, you know, we interviewed a guy called Andrew Claven when we were an American, who's uh, who, who's who's a Christian, but he said, you know, the 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 the, pur- the purpose of America is to s- to spread the ideas of England, you know, uh, and I think there's some truth to that. You know, the the ideas of liberalism in the way that I think is healthy, the healthy liberalism. They come from this country. Uh, and uh, yes, there are a lot of people who are so comfortable and so sort of, you know, they grew up and, and, and they were very, very, you know, everything was easy for them. And you go to dinner parties in this country and you, you meet, the, you know, people who, who so they're frustrated with the direction of the country, but they don't actually give a shit because they're going to be fine no matter what, right? Those people, in my way, in my way of thinking, are the problem, if you like. Um, and it, 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 that's really the question is, can we find a vigor about uh, ourselves uh, or not? And I, I, I have no idea what the answer to that question is. Part of, the, part of the problem that you put your finger on there 
is of course that many of those people, senior people in society who've, who, who've had good jobs or still have good jobs, were the very people of course who most took exception to the idea of Brexit and because they lost that argument they're then consoled by the idea that the country is going down the drain. Mm. Is that not right? Uh, that is possibly part of it, but some of the people I'm talking about are pro-Brexit. I just mean that, you know, there's a sort of like, there's a, there's a comfort level here that is unlikely to spur you into great action. <laughs> yes. Do you know what I mean? I do. And I, so I, absent a religious zealotry, uh, then, the, the, you know, what reason do you have to, to, to really do anything? Well, spare us the religious zealotry. We, mm. we tried that 350 years quite, ago, and it, was, it turned out nasty. I'm certainly not advocating for religious zealotry, can you, as you can imagine. But what I mean is, uh, you know, th whether we thrive in the future really depends on whether we're willing to have confidence in ourselves. Constantine Kishin, thank you very much indeed for being on New Human Animal. Thank you. Thanks for having me. If you've enjoyed watching this interview, and I hope you have, and you'd like to see more of this kind of work, you might care to consider making a small donation. If you go to our website, newhumanum.org, and follow the links, you'll find a donation page. Anything you can give us would be gratefully received.